I think we'll get started. Thank you for all of you for coming. Uh, I'm Marion Blakey, the president and CEO of the Aerospace Industries Association. And I'm delighted to be joined here by two genuine experts in an area that is so critical to all of us, and that is the jobs and employment in our country. So in a moment, we'll be making more introductions, but I do want to welcome all of you here, and thank you for being here. You know, Americans don't like being second to anyone on anything. And nowhere is that more true than in aerospace and defense, especially considering the role that our armed forces play around the world today. Over the past century, the United States has built a commercial and defense aerospace industry that's the envy of the world. As recently as last week, we saw the pivotal role that drones play in executing the war on terror. Our overwhelming air power has helped stop a massacre in Libya and bring in the dreaded dictator, Gaddafi. We were the first to deploy stealth technology, smart bombs, unmanned aircraft, high-resolution spy aircraft, and satellites. And we were the first to land men on the moon, send rovers to Mars, first to land spacecraft out of the solar system, launch them out of the solar system. That was the Voyager, one of my real favorites. For decades, we've seen how investments in military aerospace endeavors lead to breakthroughs that benefit all of us. After all, the internet, GPS, they grew out of DARPA research. Digital computers, commercial air travel, CT scans, all innovations from commercial aviation, military, and NASA. Our historic leadership in aerospace has also created one of the most highly skilled workforces in the world and one of the most sophisticated industrial bases anywhere. The industry supports millions of direct and indirect jobs in all 50 states. It supports cutting edge research at our universities and in numerous industries from high tech commu communications to engineering design to advanced materials and composites. And thousands of service businesses, you know, mom and pop stores, the little ones in communities, all depend on us for their livelihood. The irony is that our success in aerospace has sometimes induced a kind of complacency, an often unthinking assumption that our primacy can't be challenged, that we'll always be there, that we'll never fall behind. But the reality is that today's success flows from the conscious decisions of previous generations. They took the long view and made the investments that have built America's leadership. And if we're going to stay on top, we need to take that same long view today. But recently, we've seen some short-term budget pressures which call into question this great tradition in aerospace. For the first time in 100 years, America has no manned military combat aircraft in design, no rotorcraft for the military in design. Experts warn that we are very likely to lose our design capability for military airplanes. The average age of an Air Force fighter right now, 22 years. A bomber, 35 years. Tanker, 47 years old. Our planes are so old that more than half of the deployed naval aircraft aren't ready for combat right now. The United States has led the way in something I think we're very proud of, and that's unmanned aircraft technology. But get this. Last year, two-thirds of the spending on drones was overseas. China recently introduced 25 new drone models. And when France needed to buy new drones... They went to Israel. More than $300 billion in new military programs has been canceled in the last few years. House appropriators voted to kill the Webb telescope, even though its components are 75% built. Funding for the next generation air traffic control system also lags, even though experts say that the system would add $300 billion to the United States economy in the next 10 years. And with the retirement of the space shuttle program, 
America has got to rely on the Russians to take U.S. astronauts to orbit at a charge of roughly $60 billion a seat. That's funding that would a lot better be spent on our own space program. The really reality in all of this, the reality is the short-term thinking here strikes at the heart of this industry, the heart and soul, the men and women who've built it, those who work on the front lines in our design shops, assembly lines, shipyards, and hangars every single day. It's the impact of cuts, those already made and future cuts being considered in the coming weeks and months on these Americans and the jobs they hold that we're here to discuss today. We've asked a noted expert, Dr. Stephen Fuller, a leading economist at George Mason University, to analyze the jobs impact of the potential budget cuts, either as a result of sequestration or by other cuts of the super committee. The findings? If sequestration occurs, the cuts in the aerospace and defense portion alone could result in the loss of over one million American jobs. More than 352,000 direct and indirect aerospace and defense jobs are projected to be lost by DOD's prime contractors and their suppliers. While losses would occur in all 50 states, over half of the job losses would be concentrated in 10 states, led by California, Virginia, Texas, and Florida. Overall, the cuts would likely chop $86 billion off the GDP in 2013 alone, driving economic growth down from the projected very weak 2.3% to 1.7%. Finally, defense cuts totaling $1 trillion are projected to mean that 0.6% would be added to the rate of unemployment in 2013, which today, of course, stands at 1.9%. And by the way, this figure is entirely consistent with Secretary Panetta's recent comments that full sequestration cuts to defense would add 1% to the national unemployment rate. Because as you all know, DOD buys from many other sectors for, of the economy beyond aerospace and defense. And the DOD projection, we understand, includes cuts to the uniformed and civilian employees there. These projections are based on solid data and analysis, and they should bring some sobriety to the debate that we endeavor to put into this discussion we're having as a country. Because we need to reinvigorate our country while keeping our country safe in the world that's populated by asymmetric th threats, terrorism, and rogue states. As you can imagine, labor leaders whose members work in the aerospace and defense industry around the country are working to make sure that Congress and the administration are aware of what the current cuts to the defense budget could mean, around $480 billion, as currently projected, and the potential cuts of up to a trillion dollars under sequestration, what they will mean to the American worker. And no one is a stronger voice for the aerospace and defense worker than Tom Buffenbarger, president of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. The son of an IAM member, Tom, I understand that your first leadership post at IAM was when he was 20 years old. He's been standing four square, calling out the dangers to our workforce and to the general aviation sector, making sure people understand what's at stake. So I look forward to hearing Tom's views today on this announcement and on Dr. Fuller's announcement. Tom, we're looking forward to hearing. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Marion, and it's an honor to be invited to join you in this. The IAM has been down this road before. Defense spending cuts of this magnitude end up hollowing out America's industrial base. The highly skilled, highly motivated workforce that produces the weapons platforms our war fighters rely on are always the first casualties. The secondary targets are the plants and the machinery where those weapons platforms were built. Time and time again, we have seen state-of-the-art, 
facilities and their specialized tools mothballed for years, then dismantled and sent overseas to potential rival nations. Taking a meat cleaver to defense spending may thrill the deficit hawks, but it will leave America weaker militarily and economically. Others will speak to how this diminishes and constricts our military capacities. I want to address the economic turmoil that lies ahead. Cutting a trillion dollars from defense spending does more than kill off one million jobs. It means billions and billions in lost tax revenues for federal, state, and local governments. At the same time, state and the federal governments will incur higher costs for unemployment benefits, food stamps, Medicaid, and retraining. Adding one million highly skilled, highly educated, and highly motivated workers to the jobless roles is no way to end this great recession. In fact, it will prolong our economic anguish indefinitely. We cannot cut, cut, cut our way to prosperity. That's the Grecian formula. And we've seen just how well that works. In Greece, austerity programs have led to higher unemployment, which led to even more severe austerity programs. It's a vicious downward spiral. Policymakers need to focus on creating jobs, hiring workers, and investing in our industrial base. But the path of least resistance may be let these automatic rescissions take effect. And that, I believe, would trigger an economic disaster. My real fear is that cuts of this magnitude could trigger a second recession, one more devastating and depressing than our current one. In an already fragile economy, taking a meat ax to defense spending could have unexpected and unprecedented consequences. Mary, and that concludes my opening remarks, and I look to look forward to, uh, to Dr. Fuller's comments. Well, it's a frightening prospect in front of us, and to talk about the findings here, I would like to introduce Dr. Stephen Fuller, the Dwight Shaw Faculty Chair at George Mason University, who's been on the faculty at GMU since 1994. For 25 years before that, he was on the faculty of George Washington University. He's the director of the Center for Regional Analysis. He served on the Virginia Governor's Advisory Board under Governors Kane, Warner, Allen, and Wilder. And he's a member of the CFO Advisory Group for the District of Columbia as well. Dr. Feller has been studying workforce, employment, and federal budget issues literally for decades. And with that, I'll ask Dr. Fuller to take you through his analysis and describe some of these findings in detail. Dr. Fuller? Good. Well, thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, not spend much time on the detail. I'll wait for questions on that just because I could drone on too long. Um, I do think it, it would be helpful, though, for the um, folks in the room here to understand what, what I did just in simple terms. Um, we've taken this proposed spending reduction for fiscal 2013, uh, the total $45.01 billion. It's only for equipment, so even though the, the proposed spending reductions are much larger, but that includes personnel and, and R&D, that's not included in this. So the, the impacts that you have there in the press release, or if you have a copy of my paper, are, are just for 45% of the proposed reductions and for one year. So these are proposed to span 10 years, but we've taken the impact is for fiscal 2013, the first year uh, in which they would be uh, in effect. And, and what that $45 billion is is, is a reduction in, in sales to these companies. So if the train is that the train of logic here is you take $45 billion out of the economy. It's spread across 13 different manufacturing sectors. So aerospace is one, but there's also tank manufacturing and, and, and weapons and munitions and ships and 
proportionally, there's a little piece of that 45 that shows up in a lot of different industries that have different suppliers, different uh, payroll, different salary structures. But it, we take 45 billion, uh, reduced sales to those businesses, uh, and then we track that through changes in sales to other companies. So those companies, the, the prime contractor cuts back activity with the subcontractors. Each of those, and, and those subcontractors have suppliers. And so it gets all the way down to the rivets. I mean, I don't know enough about how you manufacture these and what goes into them, but it's clearly it's a very complicated process. These companies uh, also buy business services, technical services, engineering services, transportation services, health and education services, services that don't look like weapons and don't look like, like products. They don't sound like manufacturing goods, and, and uh, they're, they're clearly services. So there's a horizontal effect that besides just going from, from an airplane to, a, to a, a wing assemblage and to metal and to rivets and electronics, it also spans the economy through all the other support industries that businesses rely on to do their business. And, and then every one of those industries has payroll. And so we see a payroll reduction, and that reduces spending across all the, the types of businesses that you and I spend our money. We sp everybody spends their money more or less the same way. So there's a decrease in sales at grocery stores and at, at uh, department stores. Uh, there's less travel. There's less, less education spending. There's less veterinarian spending. Every sector of the economy across every single state gets impacted eventually. And it turns out that about 65% of the reductions aren't in the aerospace and military equipment manufacturing sectors. That's the way I describe it because they're so broad I can't, can't put a single name to it. So aerospace and military manufacturing sectors, their impacts from this $45 billion reduction are really just about 35% of the total, the 65% uh, is on Main Street, it's the rest of the country. It's you and me. Fewer newspaper sales, you know, fewer everything because there's less money in distribution. So sales to, to, to jobs, to personal income, to non-payroll purchases that these companies wouldn't make, to GDP. That's sort of the string that, that, that goes through here and so this $45 billion in one year re, uh, reduction in the purchases of goods, of, of hardware, of, of aerospace and military equipment purchases translates into about 300, and I have to look at the numbers, these are uh, relatively large numbers, uh, uh, 352, almost 353,000 job decrease in the, the, the aerospace and military equipment manufacturing sector and all of their suppliers, not just the producer of rivets, but also their business services, education, all of the, the businesses that support those businesses directly. And then another 350,000, uh, almost 354,000 uh, uh, jobs that, that are jobs on F Street or wherever. I mean, they include some government employees too. There's, uh, this, this takes with it a reduction of $59 billion less in payroll. So that reduction in payroll is it's taxable payroll. Uh, these aren't, this isn't industry earnings. This is earnings of the individuals who lost their jobs, the, the 1,600,000 workers. So it's, it's uh, a major reduction in spending potential in the economy. Ultimately, and then there's a $27 billion reduction in purchases of non-payroll goods and services, utilities, transportation, the, the, st the stuff that, that um, less, less shopping at, C at uh, Giant, Giant buys less groceries. So it, just, it rolls through the economy. Uh, it shows up in manufacturing, shows up in construction, shows up in agriculture. And ultimately, it, it would represent an 86 billion dollar, 86 and a half billion dollar, less growth in the economy that year. 
in, in 13. And, and the uh, forecast for growth in 13 is, is fairly modest. It's better than this year. It's not still the, the economy isn't booming yet. And it would reduce that per projected growth uh, by about 25%. So the, the economy would be growing in 13 more like it's projected to do this year, which isn't all that, that outstanding. So it shows, I mean, this, this would happen with reductions in personnel spending or reductions in other kinds. The, any reduction just rolls through the economy. Certain kinds of businesses have greater multipliers, greater impacts because of the kind of work they do. There's one other impact that I think is really important to think about and we can't model. And that's, that's not just the loss of sales, but it's the actual demise of businesses, small businesses, that many of the businesses that do business with this industry are quite specialized. And so if they lose their sales, they, don't, they can't just go sell to somebody else. That their sales are fairly restricted. It isn't so much maybe of the grocery stores and the, and the drug stores, but of the, the, the secondary suppliers or the indirect suppliers to the direct suppliers to the primes. There's, a, there's quite a chain of, of delivery there. Many small companies, when they lose 50 or 60 or 70 percent of their sales, they go out of business. And so the, the, the collateral impacts aren't measured here of, of what, what these companies do. They just can't lay off half their workers and say, we're going to do half the business to some of them. It just isn't efficient. It, they lose their economies of scale. So that's, that's a piece that we can't measure that, show that, that is just hangs out there. Uh, and, and that uh, you won't know about until it happens. I'm happy to answer questions on, on the actual analytical techniques if anybody is interested in probing those. I, I can get into more detail, but I think um, I'm, I've said what I need to say. I've said more than I need to say, so thank you. All right. Could we open it up for questions? And Roxanne, I see you back at the back, so we'll start there. In 2013, and the peak will be 2013-2014? Uh, what this, we, we've taken, this is a 10-year reduction. We've taken one-tenth of it out of the first year. Now, some of that's already gone. I mean, the, with the, the, the first uh, Budget Control Act, $19 billion, it's already been, been taken out. And so that's included into the, the 45. If, if the sequestration occurs uh, at the end of the year, that would add another 25.6 billion, or it tops it up to the 45. And that would be in effect as of fiscal 13. So and so that's, that, so that's just the first tenth of this. So you're talking a million jobs just in 2013, or are you talking over the next decade? No, that's, that's, that's the first year. They, they just are gone, and they're, they're gone again the next year. So if this if it continues on, this this number becomes a much bigger number. But this is this is this is sustained for the length of the cutbacks. So you're saying a million a million jobs a year for the next decade if sequestration comes in. Uh, well, it's 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 sustaining that million for ten years. So it isn't it isn't ten million after ten years. It's a million every. It's, it's just they're out of work for ten years and not out of work for one year. As long as that. That you know, we've we've averaged it out, so it's a constant number to illustrate the the magnitude of impact. Down here, question in the front. Chip, we're making you move around here. Uh, Steve Trumbull with Flight Global. Um, not surprisingly, I'm a journalist, and the math is kind of lost on me. But there are three questions I have. One is. The, where, where do you get $45 billion out of that 10-year figure? Um, you know, that if it's one-tenth, it's $450 billion, not, not a trillion. But I assume that's just a partial of procurement. And how do you draw that line with procurement uh, only? So if that makes sense, sorry. Can I answer that one yeah, first? Because sure. that, that's, um, uh, this is my understanding. It's, it's a trillion dollars divided by 10. So that's, that's $100 billion for one year. Right. That money covers personnel, yeah. covers R&D, 
covers the, the acquisition of uh, procurement of equipment. The, the, the equipment com share of that roughly 100 billion is 45%, which is 45 billion. How do you, how do you get 45%? Well, that's that's a value that has been given to me as what that what how that what that hundred I know a billion breaks down to. I, I, I don't see that in the budget, but I, I'd be interested to find out. Uh, more about I'm going to ask Cord, who yeah, we, served up here on the hill and did this for a hundred years. Forgive me, Cord. <laughs> if you take a look at the numbers, I mean, the hundred billion, roughly hundred billion a year is what the cost would be, and you look at the way the Budget Control Act was uh, constructed. You can eliminate the military personnel. They don't have to take cuts out of military personnel, so you set that aside. You take those cuts across the remaining. A proportional reduction when you go to O&M, procurement, R&D, right. means okay. that it, by the proportion, yeah. that's what would go into the military modernization accounts, which is where the industry right. derives its revenue. So it's 45% of non-procurement, or non-personnel. Uh, exactly. Accounts. So okay. these cuts would yeah. equate to, you would have to make 45% reduction to the non-personnel accounts. I get so it. To, to the procurement and no, that's, that's fair enough. Be better, better ask the question of the guy that knows, I guess. <laughs> sure. Sorry. Well, then the, you also said there was going to be 350000 in direct and indirect, another 350000 in broader economic impact, and then $1 million in total impact, uh, $1 million job cuts in total impact. And how does – how do you get – I mean, that doesn't uh, add up. No, I just there, – there's roughly three three fifty. Let me get the right numbers here just so we don't perpetuate the um, – any errors. It's um, – 352,750 that are, that I describe as industry-wide job losses. Uh, and that, that a portion of those are, are manufacturing jobs and a portion, uh, roughly a third of them are manufacturing jobs and two-thirds of them are other kinds of jobs that support the manufacturing activity. The other, the remainder, the 653,570, are jobs supported by the payroll spending and the non-payroll spending of, of this industry outside of the, the industry itself. So it's your salary as you spend it outside of your industry and mine out of mine. And so the, and that adds up to the million 600,000 or a million, um, one million, you know, 6,000, mm -hmm. excuse me, these are big numbers, uh, 6,032. The, the, um, so 65% of that 1 million are jobs that aren't in the industry or aren't under contract in the industry to support their business activities, their operations. And that 65% is supported by payroll spending, the loss, the act, the, the loss of, of, um, about in 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 total about a hundred and, and uh, excuse me about fifty nine billion dollars in payroll gets erased. Well, and finally, the the last question I have is the eighty six point five billion dollars in less economic growth from a forty five billion dollar cut, and how how does that amplify from forty five to eighty six point five billion economic growth? Uh, that that includes the the loss of. Uh, GDP can be broken down into earnings. So it's the loss of earnings. It's the loss of non-labor income, which would include investment and retained earnings and purchases of, of goods and services from suppliers. Uh, this is all domestic, so it, doesn't, it excludes any consideration of, of foreign, of imported products in the process. Of this. this is only the U.S. side of it. And, and the loss of the direct sales. So the 45 is in there, plus the, the loss of, of personal income or earnings and non-labor income are, are add up to be the GDP component of this. Back here, uh, Alexis. Alexis, can you come back up? Thank you. Thank you, Sandra Erwin with National Defense. Uh, Dr. Fuller, um, in the b uh, Debt Reduction Committee, they're going to have to make choices. Do we cut defense? Do we cut non-defense? Something has to be cut to cut the deficit. So um, potentially, if the cuts were made in other sectors of the economy, have you estimated the job impact uh, comparable to what you have estimated for defense cuts? I have not, but uh, you know, 
there's lots of factors that go into this decision. And these, the economic impacts, are ones that, are, that sometimes are overlooked. Uh, it certainly would behoove the entire, uh, anybody making these decisions to understand what the consequences are uh, to get to the number they want to get to. And, and uh, it's possible that some sectors have higher value added than other sectors within the economy. And you, know, you make, if you know that, then you can make a wiser decision about what you, what you re where you take your reductions. But I haven't done other calculations. I'm sure somebody will, though. Mm -hmm. Let me add just a thought or two on that, because I think it always is it, it difficult to compare one part of one sector of the economy with another. But do remember that in the defense industry, we are talking about high technology jobs. We are therefore talking about very high wage and high salaried jobs. A engineer in our field comes in, and this is right out of school, at above $50,000, makes well into six figures fairly quickly. Uh, labor on the shop floor. Again, high wages. We are talking in the 30s. I'm sure Tom would have some elaboration on that. Uh, but you start looking across the industry and you really will see that these are very good jobs that you would be losing. They also are, it's an industry where you have a lot of flow down into smaller businesses. Uh, some industries are not quite this way, but we have a lot of subcontracting into smaller suppliers, affecting therefore it gets down to mom and pops and it gets down to something that is important uh, that again Tom touched on and that is that you lose very unusual skills and businesses that simply go away and then when you want to find that technology that machining capability it's no longer there they went out of business and they went somewhere else so there's some pretty devastating impacts because of the nature of the aerospace and defense industry and from the one million jobs how many of those would be considered super high skilled jobs well, certainly the 352,000 that are the direct and indirect, absolutely. Okay, thanks. And I, w I would like to comment, those jobs uh, run between 55 and $60,000 a year. Uh, can we take a quick, anybody on the phone have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, name and uh, your, your uh, company. I didn't model that. That kind of activity is built into the economic forecast to begin with. The economy in 13 is supposed to be bigger than 12 and 12 bigger than 11, and it gets bigger because of increased spending and new businesses. Whether your specific product is reflected, that you're referring to is reflected in that analysis, I can't say. But we do know that if you pull back anywhere, you get less than you would have had had you not pulled back. So this is a subtraction from whatever the total would have been without this reduction in spending. That's, that's the way it's calculated. Well, that could be true that you, you, you add, you double your demand for machinists instead of tripling it. And, and so, you know, that's better than not having something, but it isn't having it all. I would also just make the comment that while as an industry we are very pleased that there is a resurgence on the commercial side without question. The Gear Tober fan is an excellent example of uh, new technology, new propulsion innovation. Uh, and that does, again, help to sustain American jobs. But uh, it is only, if you will, one aspect of the industry. And frankly, the two do support and 
uh, add momentum to each other. So when you do have a loss of jobs on the military side, a lot of the suppliers are ones that then will feel the loss of revenue and that drives costs higher on a unit cost basis in many cases. So there is a drag that even is felt in the commercial arena as well. And who was that speaking, please? Marion Blakey, AIA. Uh, Titus Ledbetter, publication Inside the Air Force. So when it comes to this, specifically the space domain, there was a lot of concern even before um, this budget situation about the health of the industrial base and second and third tier suppliers. So I was wondering if you can um, provide any thoughts um, how this might affect what, you know, how this might affect the space domain and what aspects of this within the space domain could be affected. There's lots of, there's a wide variety of projects um, including your traditional large space satellites, but also smaller satellites and different engines. So do you have any thoughts on which aspect of the space domain could be a f sp second and third tier suppliers, you know, could be particularly impacted by this? This is Marion Blake again. I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that because the space domain is both uh, in the national security military arena as well as NASA, uh, you find that those suppliers supply both. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to reduce the demand, uh, so solid rocket motors are a good example for, for one, uh, you're going to find that those suppliers uh, have almost nowhere to go. Uh, and the military has provided a tremendous amount of the business in this arena uh, that has also kept the cost for NASA down. So the two have been complementary. But in the chain that supports you find a lot of the same businesses. And when you go down to the Space Coast in Florida, you'll see the effect uh, in a number of technology suppliers down there that are, are desperately <coughs> worried about their future. And what specifically have you been hearing from um, second and third tier suppliers in the space domain? Are they coming to you now with worries as we move forward in this budget process? And what are they saying to you? I think they're saying that it is critical that we point out the fact that, you know, the uh, domains that I think people think about first and foremost, uh, land, sea, air, uh, are also these days very much supported by our space assets. Uh, we could not have accomplished what we have with our uh, unmanned aircraft. We could not possibly have accomplished the kind of surveillance and reconnaissance we're doing without those assets, and it drives the cost higher for those assets not to have uh, those suppliers able to thrive in this environment. So yes, they're worried about it both from the standpoint of what it does for our overall defense as well as for their uh, bread and butter. We're going to take one more question for Dr. Fuller. He has to run and teach a class. On the phone, anybody with a question for Dr. Fuller? Here. Anybody? Yeah. Well, it's quite likely that they would have unemployment insurance, but we have not counted that. That's another cost. So we've just, you know, the unemployment insurance has to come from somewhere or payments. Where they go get another job, that would be taking that job away from somebody else who needs a job. There are 16 or 15 million unemployed workers out there already looking for jobs. So we didn't, we didn't add any adjustment back into the model for some additional earnings that these unemployed, newly unemployed workers might receive. So this is the unadulterated impact, and clearly some will find something else to do, but at the net expense of the economy altogether. Tom, did you have something to add I, on this? Well, I, I would just like to comment in real, in real life terms, because that's the world I live in. I represent 
those machinists to uh, manufacture both defense and commercial products. The defense industry has served us well in this respect as the great stabilizer maintaining the industrial base, especially in troubled economic times, because military contracts are generally awarded on a long-term basis. On the commercial side, and I would point as to 9-11 as a good example, uh, across America, commercial aerospace was going great guns. Overnight, that market dried up. Tens of thousands of workers lost their jobs. The one place there was some stability to keep some order about the industrial base was the military uh, production underway. Again, it had been awarded on a long-term basis. You don't cancel out fighters too easily, as we saw com customers do to Boeing and to Airbus. And then as far as the workers who are affected adversely by uh, the proposed budget cuts or will be affected, those jobs at McDonald's that the caller referred to, they're already taken by senior citizens these days who are competing with the kids <laughs> trying to find employment. There are no other jobs. I will, uh, real life examples, Wichita, Kansas, in 2008, we had 10,000 job openings among the entire aerospace community in Wichita. We could not fill the jobs because we could not find the skilled people. We quit training machinists. We quit training aviation electronics people. We quit training aviation certified welders. So we scoured the country looking for workers to come to Wichita. By the first part of 2009, when the economy had tanked at the end of 2008, we had 9,000 layoffs in Wichita. That's a net shift of almost, at that time, 20,000 jobs. There was nothing left in Wichita to go to work for. There were no other jobs that had not already been claimed by a senior citizen or somebody desperate for work. So that base dissipates from Wichita. And it is hard to reassemble that when times turn around. The Space Coast, another example. We're going to lose about 10,000 highly skilled, highly educated workers, many of whom this union is honored and proud to represent. And when that work is gone, they're going to dissipate. How they, they assembled in Florida at the beginning of our space program. And once they dissipate with nothing on the horizon line, we'll play havoc to ever reassemble the teams we have in place. That's a national asset for our defense and for our prosperity on commercial ventures. Um, I go back to an engineer I once heard from Lockheed who gave a presentation, imagine a day without space. And you sit there and wonder, well, what does that mean? She said, well, your cell phone wouldn't be ringing. You wouldn't have found this place without your GPS, given the location we were in at the time. And the list went on and on from medicine to food processing to the, to the uh, uh, lighter side of life, all rooted in space. And that all began generally with some defense project, defense-related idea that uh, spawned great things for this country. Um, these kinds of cuts that are being contemplated and that the AIA and Dr. Fuller uh, have addressed here, uh, I don't know that I can put uh, enough passion or emphasis on just how devastating this can be for the United States if we give up. I worry about us ever getting back to where we were in space. If we give up, as, as one uh, questioner poised the fact about the Joint Strike Fighter, if we give up on a, a fifth generation fighter, we're done. We're done. China's not giving up on it. The Russians will not give up. Maybe the politics of the world has changed a little bit, but once we lose, the edge to be uh, taken seriously on this planet. We're done. 
And we will live in the time that we consigned our country to a lesser status, not the way I was raised. Okay, we do need to let uh, Dr. Fuller get to his next appointment and I think wrap it up. Could, could we grab your question as after the conference is over? Is that okay? Uh, anybody on the phone, uh, there are names on the press advisory and press release. Uh, if you need to follow up with Dr. Fuller, give us a call. We'll put you in touch with him. Uh, we can also connect you over to Mr. Buffenbarger uh, 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 if, if needed and Marion Blakey. All right, thanks very much. We need to wrap.